Good day to everyone and welcome to today's webinar where we will tackle the most crucial stage of the arbitration process, annulment, recognition, and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. While they are technically no longer part of the arbitral proceedings, these post arbitration proceedings are of utmost importance as it is the penult penultimate objective to any winning party to enforce an arbitral award and not left with paper victory. I am therefore very delighted to be your MC for today's webinar. I am J. Patrick Santiago, a member of the Asian Institute of Alternative Dispute Resolution and currently part of the AIADR's Professional Development and Education Committee. I'm a solicitor in England and Wales since 2017 and a lawyer in the Philippines since 2009. Having worked in the Philippines and Hong Kong, I've acted as an arbitrator, a tribunal secretary and arbitration counsel in several international arbitrations. Currently, I handle legal issues across ASEAN jurisdictions with focus in the Philippines and Vietnam. Join me as we hear from our esteemed panelists regarding their thoughts on today's topic. If you have any questions at any time, please do not hesitate to use the Q&A button that you can find at the lower portion of your Zoom window. To formally, to formally welcome everyone, it is my honor, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce the president of the AIADR, Dato Professor Sundar Raju. Professor Raju is a certified international ADR practitioner and chartered arbitrator. He is the former director of the Asian International Arbitration Center. He played an active role in transforming AIAC into a sought after arbitration center in the Asian region with AIAC caseload growing massively from a mere 22 cases in 2010 to an accumulative total of 2,761 arbitration, adjudication, and mediation cases in 2019. He was also the president of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators in 2016 and the past chairman 
of the Asian Domain Name Dispute Resolution Center. Professor Raju is an advocate and solicitor of the High Court of Malaya, registered professional architect, registered town planner, fellow of the Royal Institution of Surveyors, and has had over 310 appointments in international and domestic arbitrations across numerous international arbitral institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, let's all welcome, let's all hear from Professor, Professor Sundar Raju. Professor? Okay, thank you, Jay. Uh, uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Our excellencies, esteemed panelists, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, warm greetings from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And I'm privileged to welcome you to this webinar on annulment, recognition, and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards. The recent arbitration award of Fonan, all that versus Malaysia, involving the descendants of the Sultanate of Sulu versus Malaysia, has garnered considerable attention in Malaysia and internationally as regards to the arbitral process, the award itself, and the quantum of USD 14.92 billion awarded against Malaysia. Now, the real question is whether the arbitral award can be annulled in France or otherwise recognizable and enforceable in the various other countries under the New York Convention. The dispute arose from the legal characterization and enforcement of an instrument in the 1878 agreement and the 1903 confirmatory deed between the Sultan of Zulu and the British North Borneo Company over a portion of territory along the north coast of Borneo. The claimants are direct descendants and legal heirs of Jamal ul Kiram II, the last Sultan of Sulu and North Borneo, and successor in title. Whereas Malaysia as respondent is the successor in title of the British North Borneo Company as the territory now is part of the state of Sabah, Malaysia. The claimants commenced the arbitration in 2017 in which Malaysia had chosen not to be involved in the proceedings except for a short period of time as stated in the final award. Also, the seat of arbitration was moved from Madrid to Paris in the course of the arbitration. During the currency of the arbitration, the Malaysian High Court issued an anti-arbitration injunction to restrain the said arbitration proceedings on the grounds of sovereign immunity. But early this year, the final award was published that provided that the claimants are entitled to recover restitution value of rights over the leased territory along the North Borneo from the two agreements. Malaysia was directed to pay the claimed sum of 14.92 billion to the claimants. Now, it is recently reported by way of a statement in the Malaysian parliament that the Malaysian government will not recognize the state. Uh, claim and the arbitration award and will take all necessary steps to annul it and also prevent its recognition and enforcement. Now, the aim of this webinar is to clarify the issues, to understand what is annulment, recognition, enforcement of foreign arbitral awards that will generally apply to foreign arbitration awards from an international perspective. Perhaps uh, by this discussion, it will give some clarity on how this will play out as the parties in the Zulu Arbitral Award go about to annul or enforce it. Now, I take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Professor Rahmat Mohammad, a moderator for the session, former ELCO uh, uh, Secretary General, and the, all the esteemed panelists, Ms. Elodie Dulek, Mr. Julian Bailey, Mr. Tom, Dr. Thomas Kudzel, and Ms. Rina C to this webinar. I'm sure given the expertise and experience of the panelists, we hope to gain a deeper insight and clarity on the issue. Once again, I express my utmost gratitude for all of you all being present today. Thank you so much for your support and time. I wish you an enlightening session. All the best wishes to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Raju. Uh, that I'm really looking forward to a very exciting panel discussion. Um, so without further ado, let us proceed with the panel discussion by introducing, first of all, our moderator for today's event. Our moderator is Professor Dato Rahmat Mohammed. 
Rahmat Mohammed is the former Deputy Vice Chancellor of University Technology Mara Malaysia. He is also a professor of international law and was the former dean of the Faculty of Law of the same university. Rahmat Mohammed was appointed as the fifth Secretary General of the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization, also known as ALCO, on 20 June 2008 at ALCO's 47th annual session held in New Delhi, India. He was subsequently unanimously reappointed on June 18, 2012 at ALCO's 51st annual session in Aruja, Nigeria. In 2016, Rahmat Mohammed was Malaysia's representative in the second preparatory committee of the UN in the subject of marine biodiversity in area beyond national jurisdiction. He is currently a member of the eminent person group of ALCO, and he is currently a professor of law at UITM, an adjunct professor at the Sultan Sharif Ali Islamic University, Brunei Darussalam, and a visiting professor at Erlanga University, Indonesia. Our moderator, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dato Rahmat Mohammed. Um, it's also my honor to introduce the other panelists for today's event. The next panelist would be Dr. Thomas Quatzel. Um, Dr. Quatzel is a German attorney at law practicing in Stuttgart. I don't know how to pronounce this, but he's a partner um, in the law firm Tumil Schultz and Partner. He is admitted to the local bar since 1986 and also a registered foreign lawyer in Singapore where Thomas Schultz and partner maintain an office since 1984. After law studies in Tubingen and Geneva, he was promoted to a doctor of law and comparative law thesis on forms of suretyship in England and their treatment in private international law. Dr. Klotzel has been acting as counsel and arbitrator in numerous arbitration proceedings administered under the ICC, DIS, BIAC, SIAC, ad hoc, and others. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Klotzel. Our next panelist, ladies and gentlemen, is Elodie Dulac. She is a partner in King & Spalding Singapore office and a member of the firm's international arbitration group. Elodie has represented clients in commercial and, arb and investment arbitrations around the world with a particular focus on Asia, where she has been based for over 15 years. In addition to her work as counsel, Ms. Dulac has been appointed as an arbitrator in the ICC, SIAC, AIAC, HKIAC, KIAC, and ad hoc arbitrations. She is listed in Who's Who Legal Future Leaders Top 10 Asia Pacific Wide and has been recognized in Chambers Asia Pacific and Legal 500. Elodie is admitted to practice in England, Wales, solicitor advocate, as well as in Paris, France. She is a registered foreign lawyer at the Singapore International Commercial Court. Ladies and gentlemen, Elodie Dulac. Our next panelist, ladies and gentlemen, is Julian Bailey. Julian is a partner in the London office of White and Case, practicing in the firm's international arbitration and construction and engineering groups. Julian is actively involved in construction law issues and was chairman of the Society of Construction Law from 2015 to 2016. He is also the author of one of the leading books on construction law titled Construction Law, London Publishing Partnership, third edition in 2020. The book is a three volume general text on construction law as it applies in England, Australia, Hong Kong, and Singapore with an international outlook. He is a visiting fellow at the Dixon Poon School of Law, King's College London, and an adjunct professor of law at Hamad bin Khalifa University in Doha. That's, ladies and gentlemen, our panelist, Julian Bailey. Our last finalist, last, uh, last panelist, last but not the least, is Rina C. She is a member of Wilmer Hale's international arbitration practice and focuses on complex multi-jurisdictional disputes. She has represented clients in both institutional and ad hoc arbitrations seated in common law and civil law jurisdictions, including in Europe and Asia under various arbitration rules, including the ICC, LCIA, SIAC, and UNCTRAL arbitration rules, governed by a broad variety of substantive and procedural laws. Prior to joining Wilmer Hale, Ms. E was a prosecutor and solicitor for one of New Zealand's Crown solicitors, focusing on commercial, regulatory, and criminal litigation on behalf of various government departments, including in high-profile litigation against parties involved in finance company collapses. 
She has also served as an advisor at the New Zealand Financial Markets Authority on Secondment. Ladies and gentlemen, our final um, panelist, Ms. Rena C. Now that I've introduced our moderator and our distinguished panelists, I will now hand over the floor to our panelist moderator, Professor Dato Rahmat Muhammad. Professor. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for the very kind uh, introduction. Um, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to all participants, eminent speakers, distinguished guests, and our president, Dr. Sundar Raju, for uh, inviting us, all the eminent panelists, uh, I act, acting as a moderator for this very important webinar on the subject of a uh, very important area of arbitration, namely annulment, enforcement, and recognition. Um, of course, we, we have heard uh, what uh, the president uh, had uh, said in his uh, introductory remark that uh, this is a very important uh, webinar because uh, it, it involves uh, not just a simple uh, arbitration issues, particularly in relation to annulment, uh, recognition and enforcement, but it involves uh, one very recent arbitral award which involved Malaysia. And uh, of course, it also involved a very old case really because it is very much based on the historical claim by the Sultanate of Sulu uh, that uh, they have uh, legitimate right and interest over uh, Sabah uh, situated in the north of Borneo. Uh, Sabah now of course is Malaysia. So I think that there are two parts of this webinar. One is we want to hear uh, from our eminent speakers uh, as regard to uh, the enforcement recognition of foreign arbitral award uh, and, and it's what does it implies its implication uh, and, and uh, of course uh, they will be talking on various jurisdictions not just uh, English but also Germany and, and France uh, so these, these are very important and secondly of course uh, uh, we would like them to highlight the, um, the issues regarding the arbitral award of Sulu claim over Sabah. Uh, as uh, mentioned by Dato President, that uh, it, this had created a lot of interest among uh, academia, the practitioners, and students as well. So I think it is uh, very timely. I must congratulate uh, the Institute uh, AIADR for, for having this uh, uh, webinar and uh, we hope by, by having these uh, discussions and deliberation by uh, very foremost uh, legal mind and arbitration, uh, we hope that uh, it will throw some light as to the blurry situation uh, in the Sulu claim uh, recently. And uh, I must say that uh, the webinar here will be divided uh, basically into three segments. Uh, the first uh, will discuss on annulment and setting aside uh, foreign arbitration award, uh, which I will invite uh, Dr. Thomas and followed by uh, Rina C to give their view uh, on uh, this very two, two very important aspect of arbitration, annulment and setting aside of foreign arbitration, perhaps they would be discussing on uh, the, the jurisdiction or the various jurisdiction, how it applies in Germany and, and perhaps in, 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 in UK. Uh, and, and, and you have uh, about 12 minutes each. And, um, and later, if there are others, eminent, uh, other eminent palladies who would like to join in, please do so uh, because we have about 30 minutes uh, for each segment. Then we will move on to the second segment where I will invite uh, the other panelists. And finally, we will discuss on the uh, arbitral award of the Sulu claims. So uh, without further ado, may I invite Dr. Thomas to begin uh, his presentation. Please, uh, Dr. Thomas, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Professor. Rahmat Muhammad, 
for giving the floor to me and the 12 minutes uh, to talk on a fairly complex subject matter. Let me first of all thank uh, Professor Sundar Raju for inviting me and sharing this August panel and uh, to share with you some uh, aspects of a complex subject matter. As Jay has pointed out, uh, at the end of the day, uh, in arbitration proceedings, we have an award. And if an award cannot be enforced, it's just not worth the paper. It's written on it. And now and then it's very costly. Uh, so, so the question, what happens uh, if the award is there? What are the defenses uh, against uh, such an award? Uh, uh, is, 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 a, is the topic uh, uh, of all topics, basically. Normally, it's uh, the uh, uh, respondent, which is uh, who is dissatisfied with an award, but there are also, of course, situations where uh, a claimant may be dissatisfied with an award. Next slide, please. Let me briefly introduce uh, some uh, general aspects. I think arbitration is a privatization of civil justice as we see it. And I think uh, its aim is to oust the jurisdiction of the state courts. And at least from Germany, there is no, there are no reasons at all why this right of party autonomy uh, should be in any manner questioned. But of course, we see certain developments uh, in uh, uh, in Europe in particular, uh, where uh, arbitration in particular, as far as the involvement of states is concerned, is under uh, scrutiny. And uh, we see certain developments uh, in Germany, uh, of course, coming from Europe, where arbitration as a general means of dispute resolution has to be uh, uh, reconsidered. And one of the aspects which is uh, uh, dragging us here is the, the plan to set up a European multilateral investment court uh, with a view to uh, reform the existing investment state dispute settlement system. The reason which are, uh, which are given are fairly, uh, fairly clear by the European uh, Parliament. Uh, they basically say that there is a lack of transparency, issues of predictability and consistency are in question and excessive costs are involved. Now, uh, one thing is clear, uh, arbitration cannot stand alone without the state courts. Uh, I think that although, at least from a German perspective, under paragraph uh, 1055 of our Civil Proceedings Act, uh, the award has, as amongst the parties, the quality of a final and conclusive judgment. So that means not that it can be enforced. You have to go to the state court and there it becomes very apparent that the state court, whatever structure arbitration has, have a complementary role uh, uh, to deal uh, with arbitration proceedings. Uh, at the end, when the award is there, uh, recognizing and enforcing it, or eventually if there are some uh, deficits uh, in the arbitral award, uh, with uh, eventually setting it aside. Uh, but of course, there are further complementary uh, complementary uh, points uh, during the arbitral process. If there is an ad hoc arbitration, the state courts may have a role to appoint arbitrators. Of course, uh, if there is an evidentiary process, an arbitral tribunal has no means to uh, to compel the appearance of a witness. So also there, uh, there is a a, uh, a need for a, a curial intervention. Uh, upon request of the arbitral tribunal and with the involvement of the parties, of course. In Germany, some pressure has come up uh, uh, after the turnaround in 2011 uh, 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 of the uh, German nuclear policy, and that triggered the whole process uh, 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 when, when uh, uh, Germany was uh, sued uh, before an exit panel uh, for uh, damages. And that the result of that uh, process uh, was now the discussions that we are con uh, currently facing with the European Multilateral Investment Court. But as the, the, what we clearly must distinguish, and that also applies, of course, to uh, to the uh, to arbitrations where states are involved. States can act in two capacities. They can act as commercial businesses when they instruct the, uh, in, or give, give a, a, a contract for constructing a road or a bridge or whatever, 
Uh, so these acts like these are, are, are clearly com of commercial nature, the acta jure uh, uh, gestiones, uh, as it is said, if we come to the question of unity, and of course there are also the acta jure imperii, where uh, uh, of course uh, uh, the state may be immune from arbitration. But as a matter of principle, the state can be a party to arbitration proceedings. Uh, there's no question about that. Next slide, please. Uh, in Germany, after the reform of our arbitration law in 1998, I think we clearly apply the principle of territoriality. So it means Germany does not recognize an, a, nas a national or a delocalized uh, de arbitration proceedings. Uh, it must be attached to a certain jurisdiction and uh, and cannot be let's say uh, flying in some like the French doctrine and developed uh, from Emmanuel Gaillard, if I see that correctly, some kind of transnational sphere where where uh, the the the, uh, the role uh, uh, of the state uh, to deal with arbitrations is is basically uh, limited to enforcing the award, uh, 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 and that's it. Uh, we, we need a place of arbitration to link uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the arbitration proceedings to a certain uh, uh, place of arbitration. And of course, this seat or place of the arbitration is decisive for the further uh, uh, assessment and the whole process and evaluation of what has happened in an arbitration. Next slide. Uh, in Germany, we have the competence competence issue. It means that uh, an arbitral tribunal may rule on its own jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, for that purpose, uh, that is very important. The arbitration clause is to be treated as an agreement independent of the other terms of the contract. What we see at the moment uh, is that there is a, a, a strong tendency uh, to uh, look uh, 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 and qualify the arbitration agreement at, or, or to look for a, the proper law of the uh, uh, arbitration agreement separately from the terms of the contract. At least from the German perspective, I think there is a presumption that what the proper law of the contract means will also be the proper law of the agreements to arbitrate. The next point uh, is that the lack of, no, no, not the next slide, please go back. Uh, under, uh, under subsection two, if you, yeah, under subsection two, uh, I think it's clear that the objection that an arbitral tribunal, uh, uh, the mega jurisdiction of an arbitral tribunal must be raised at a certain point of time and not later than the statement of defense. It means that boycotting uh, arbitration proceedings is not an option. Uh, when once an arbitration uh, request is received, uh, and uh, uh, by the addressee, be the state or be the, uh, uh, the national of a, uh, of, a, of a particular country, it has to do something with it. Uh, uh, it. It's sufficient that knowledge is there that these arbitration proceedings are pending, and if, uh, and if so, there is the need to make a, an objection against the uh, competence of the arbitral tribunal. A particular feature is in uh, subparagraph uh, there may be an interlocutory decision uh, by the arbitral tribunal on its jurisdiction. And once this uh, interim decision is there, a party uh, is required from the perspective of German law to make a, an application for review uh, of that interim decision on jurisdiction, failing which uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the competence of the arbitral tribunal can no longer, or the lack of competence can no longer be invoked. Now, next slide. The question of non-participation, I think um, it's clear that the arbitral tribunal, as opposed to other uh, rulings in uh, the German procedural law, cannot proceed on the assumption that what has been submitted by a claimant is correct as far as facts is concerned, uh, the arbitral tribunal is always under the obligation to enter into an evidentiary process, even if there is no uh, respondent available and making any statements as regards the merits of the case. It has to take uh, the evidence. 
uh, but uh, if that is done, uh, then I think the arbitral tribunal can proceed uh, with deciding and making an award uh, without uh, the participation of the respondent. Next slide. As far as the recognition of foreign awards is concerned, uh, uh, German law, of course, has implemented the New York Convention for 1958. Uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, Rina will go in a little bit more detail uh, uh, as regards to various issues for, uh, for considering um, uh, the, the, the possibilities to set aside or uh, uh, request uh, enforcement. Or, or resist enforcement of an award. I think uh, one thing is clear if you look at paragraph, uh, subparagraph two, when the declaration of enforceability is denied, uh, an award will not be set aside because, of course, the German court cannot set aside a foreign award, but it can only state that it cannot be recognized uh, within Germany. And paragraph three is also, subparagraph three is also important that once uh, 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 an award has been declared enforceable and it, it is then set aside at, at the country of origin, then uh, uh, an application may be made for setting aside uh, the declaration of enforcement that may have already been made. Next slide. Just very briefly, the uh, other uh, uh, selected treaties which are mentioned as regards foreign awards is the Geneva Convention and the very often forgotten European Convention of 1961 on international commercial arbitration. And there are, of course, a number of bilateral treaties, such as the Treaty of Friendship between Germany and the Federal, uh, Federal uh, Republic of Germany. Uh, the New York Convention ensures that always the most favorable system of law applies to the request and aims to achieve to a greatest extent, to the greatest extent possible. Uh, the uh, recognition and enforcement of the award. Next slide, please. Very briefly, a few points uh, which, which are important from a, from a German perspective. Uh, the award creditor will, in enforcement proceeding, have the owners of proof to show that there was a valid agreement to arbitrate. And the executor court, meaning the enforcement court, it is not bound by the findings of the arbitral tribunal on the validity. It has its own authority to evaluate and consider whether the agreement to arbitrate uh, uh, has, has, uh, 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 is valid or not. And uh, it is uh, sufficient in the enforcement proceedings for an award debtor to show that it has raised the defense in good time before the arbitral tribunal, even if thereafter it decided not to continue with the arbitration proceedings. Next slide. The, the, the most complex, uh, of course, and the open door uh, under the New York Convention for attacking an award is under the public policy uh, event. Uh, of course, there are other issues like uh, irregularities, but what is, of course, uh, uh, an important aspect is the violation of the internal public policy. And I think here, uh, as far as domestic awards are concerned, uh, you need a violation of basic and elementary notions of the legal order, which is a very high hurdle. And uh, it, there, there is also the approach of the so-called international order of public, uh, which is even more lenient. Basically, if a person or entity engages in commercial, uh, in international cross-border trade, it has to accept that there are additional risks uh, so, so the level for giving a uh, uh, leave to a public policy defense is extremely high under German law. Next slide. A particular feature of German law was the so-called preclusion uh, under the uh, even new law, uh, but uh, uh, it, it, uh, the, the, the new arbitration act came into force in 1998. There were a number of court rulings which compelled uh, the award uh, data who resisted enforcement to show to the enforcement court that it took a timely limited uh, uh, action for setting aside at the country of origin of the award. And if that has not been done, it was simply precluded 
uh, and could not raise uh, anything uh, as far as uh, uh, let's say the uh, regularity of the uh, of uh, of, uh, of the proceedings or uh, the the the, the uh, uh, lack of an agreement to arbitrate that would simply be ruled out. Uh, next slide. But that has changed uh, uh, after a decision of the Federal Supreme Court uh, in 2010, uh, where we had a, an award rendered in French uh, in a quite particular scenario where the arbitration agreement uh, foresaw also an appeal against the award itself. Uh, but the uh, defendant and respondent uh, in these proceedings did not take an appeal against the uh, award, nor did it bring an action to set aside. Um, but then, um, the, uh, when, when the award creditor came to Germany and uh, uh, tried to enforce the award, uh, the uh, award debtor resisted enforcement, and it could argue and say that there is no, uh, there was no valid uh, 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 agreement to arbitrate without having taken at the seat of the arbitration. Uh, the 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 the, uh, uh, the, the uh, available remedies that he has. So that completes my. Uh, we I went very fast through all this, and uh, I, I think that took a little bit more than the twelve minutes. But I hope it's acceptable. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and of course, I'm uh, delighted to say a little bit more also on the Sulu Award. Uh, of course, it's a pending case, and one has to be cautious, not knowing everything about it. And uh, we can't, of course, at least I can't give any advice, but of course I have my views on that and we come to that at a later stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. I'm sure there are a lot of questions that will be posed uh, later by the participants. And may, may I now move to uh, Rina C. Please, uh, you take the floor. Rina C. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you're able to see and hear me as well as see um, my screen. Um, so um, a good afternoon, and I'm of course very honored to be here among such a um, prestigious company, and thank you um, so much for inviting me. Um, and I'm also looking forward to the discussion on the very interesting topic of the Fornan Award. Um, I am Singaporean by nationality, so I do have some connection to the region. Um, so as Dr. Kletzel um, has mentioned earlier, I'll talk a little bit more broadly about the grounds for setting aside an arbitral award under the UNSA trial model law, um, as well as recent decisions involving the setting aside of arbitral awards. So um, Article 5 of the New York Convention, where we often start, um, is actually concerned with the grounds on which the recognition and enforcement of arbitral awards may be refused. The setting aside of awards is only referred to in Article 5.1e. It's only one of the grounds on which an award may be refused recognition and enforcement if the award has been set aside by an authority under the law of which that award was made. So this is a reference to the seat of the arbitration, um, the national courts, the state courts were supervisory jurisdiction over the um, arbitration. So what's the purpose of setting aside proceedings? It's intended as a mirror action to enforcement proceedings. A dissatisfied party can actively bring proceedings to set aside the award and doesn't have to wait for an award creditor to enforce the award before resisting it. But the New York Convention actually imposes no express limits on the grounds on which annulment of an arbitral award may be sought, other than stipulating um, where an award can be set aside. So there are two consequences of this. First, we must look to the national law. And second, set aside proceedings can only be brought in the arbitral seat, uh, the country in which the award is made. So this brings me to the model law. Until 1985, arbitration laws around the world contained different grounds for setting aside an award. This changed with the model law, which seeks to achieve uniformity across national laws where international arbitration is concerned and has been very successful in doing so. So the model law has been adopted in 85 states, including Malaysia. Article 34 of the model law governs the setting aside of arbitral awards. And Article 34.2 sets out in detail the grounds on which an award may be set aside, 
All Article 34.3 provides that an application for setting aside must be made within three months of receiving the award. Recourse against an award in the setting aside action can only be made if these requirements are met. So the solution adopted by the model law uh, was for these setting aside grounds to mirror the grounds for refusing recognition and enforcement under the New York Convention. Um, there are six grounds typically available to annul an award. For the first of these grounds, which um, first four of these grounds, which are based in Article 5.1 of the New York Convention, the party seeking annulment of the award must raise these grounds and bears a, bears a burden proof of establishing them. For the last two grounds, the non-arbitrability of the dispute and where the award is contrary to the public policy of the annulment forum, the model law allows national courts to raise the sua sponte without the award debtor affirmatively raising the issue. But in these cases, the burden of proof generally also remains on the award debtor. So the first ground reflects the fundamental importance um, of consent in international arbitration. Without a valid agreement to arbitrate, there is no basis for either an arbitration or an arbitral award. Choice of law issues may arise, but this ground explicitly provides for the applicable law to be the law to which the parties have subjected their arbitration agreement, um, or failing any indication, the law of the arbitral seat. The validity of an arbitration agreement and party capacity will usually have already been substantively dealt with earlier at the annulment stage than the annulment stage. So, for example, Article 8 of the model law is the provision by which a court is required to enforce arbitration agreements and refer matters to arbitration unless it finds that the agreement is null and void, inoperative, or incapable of being performed. The analysis of whether there is a, a valid arbitration agreement. Um, is effectively the same as this inquiry. Um, the question will generally also have been already determined by the tribunal itself. Article 16 of the model law reflects the principle of competence competence that Dr. Putzel has already discussed. Um, it also reflects the distinct principle of separability um, and this presumption also applies in annulment proceedings. So to set aside an award for lack of a valid arbitration agreement, it is the arbitration agreement itself and not the underlying contract that must be non-existent or invalid. So at these earlier stages, a party seeking to enforce an arbitration agreement bears the burden of proof, but once there is an arbitral award at the annulment stage, in many jurisdictions, the burden of proof shifts to the party seeking to annul the award. So then what is the effect of the prior jurisdictional ruling by the arbitral tribunal? Unlike some of the other grounds, most national courts apply a de novo standard and reconsider the question of the existence and validity of an arbitration agreement rather than simply reviewing the tribunal's jurisdictional decision. And so this principle was explained by the UK Supreme Court in the well-known decision of Della, which is on the slide, um, which explained that a party who has not submitted to the arbitrator's jurisdiction is entitled to a full judicial determination on evidence. Um, and in the recent UCOS decision of the Dutch Supreme Court, which um, was concerned with the setting aside of awards of over 50 billion US dollars against Russia, the court held that the final word on the jurisdiction of the arbitrators rests with the court and the assessment must be made without restraint. So the Supreme Court held that where this ground was concerned, new arguments could be raised at the setting aside stage even if they had not been raised before the arbitral tribunal. So even though neither the English nor Dutch arbitration statutes are strictly model law statutes, many of the principles are derived from and consistent with the model law. The text of the model law itself also contemplates a de novo reconsideration of jurisdictional rulings. So you can see that Article 16.3 provides that a dissatisfied party may request a court to decide the matter it doesn't provide for the court to review the matter. Um, and there is no reference in Article 34 to any deference to arbitral determinations. So having said that, if a tribunal's award on jurisdiction is well-reasoned and based on extensive fact-finding, there is nothing preventing a national court from giving substantial weight to the arbitrator's analysis and conclusions. The Singapore High Court, for example, has held that an application for setting aside on this ground, 
doesn't mean that it would necessarily be a complete rehearing of everything that had occurred before the arbitral tribunal. Um, finally, a court may reject a party's challenge to the award on the basis that it had waived its jurisdictional objections. So Article 16.2 and 3 of the model law provide for specific timeframes in which a jurisdictional objection must be raised in the arbitration, and then for a court to decide on the issue following a positive jurisdictional ruling. And this is what Dr. Kretzel had mentioned earlier. Um, failing to take these steps can be held, uh, has been held to preclude subsequent challenges under Article 34 on the basis that it uh, constitutes an implied agreement to proceed with the arbitration, um, and sometimes more practically because requiring a party to object during the arbitration avoids wasting resources um, on an unnecessary arbitration proceeding. So there are courts that have upheld the right of a non-participating respondent to challenge an award under Article 34. So the Singapore Court of Appeal has held that a non-participating respondent remains entitled to raise a jurisdictional objection at the set-aside stage, even if it hadn't invoked the Article 16.3 mechanism. But I also noted that doing so is risky because if it turns out the respondent is mistaken in its belief that the tribunal lacked jurisdiction, the respondent would be left with a valid and forcible award against it and no uh, subsequent challenge to jurisdiction will be successful. Um, the next ground of setting aside, under, um, setting aside an award under the model law relates to a party being unable to present its case. This ground relates to the fundamental due process rights rather than a failure to comply with the party's agreed procedures, which is a separate ground under the model law. This procedural guarantee of equal treatment and full opportunity to present one's case is reflected in Article 18. So many different issues have given rise to complaints under this ground um, and equivalent provisions in national arbitration st statutes, and most of which are not successful. Unlike challenges for lack of jurisdiction, courts tend to accord substantial deference to arbitrators' procedural decisions where procedural unfairness must be extreme um, and cause a material uh, effect on the arbitral process and be a material violation before it can give rise to a setting aside. Um, the third ground is concerned with the situation where a tribunal has exceeded its authority under the arbitration agreement. So while the question of the tribunal's jurisdiction also arises here, this is different from the first ground because here there is a valid arbitration agreement, but the award deals with the dispute that goes beyond the scope of the submission to arbitration. Uh, many issues have also given rise to complaints under this ground, and although some courts consider the scope of the arbitrator's jurisdiction de novo, others have um, accorded substantial deference to arbitrators' rulings about the scope of the arbitration um, agreement. And just like um, a lack of a valid arbitration agreement, the jurisdictional objection can also be waived for failure to raise it within the specified time frame. Then going on to the fourth ground, this is concerned with failures to comply with arbitral procedures agreed by the parties, or in the absence of such agreement, the arbitral procedures prescribed by the law of the seat. Um, this is focused on enforcing the parties' agreement or failing that the procedures stipulated by the arbitral seats, an example of this can be seen on the slide. Um, the last two grounds on which an award may be set aside are those of non-arbitrability and violation of public policy. And both grounds are again focused on the law of the annulment forum. So I won't spend too much time on this, uh, but I will make two observations. So first, although the public policy exception as, as Dr. Klitzwer said, it's one of the most frequently invoked bases for annulling arbitration awards. Courts have taken a very restrictive approach to what would contravene public policy. Um, language such as shock the conscience or is clearly injurious to the public good or wholly offensive to the public um, has been used as the relevant standard. So it typically refers to conduct such as fraud uh, and corruption. And to, to give an example, in a recent decision, concerning the annulment of an ad hoc arbitral award against Libya for over 900 million US dollars, the Egyptian Court of Appeal had annulled an award on the basis that the award was manifestly disproportionate and contrary to the international public policy on the proportionality of damages. And on appeal, um, which is what you see on the slide here, the Court of Cassation of Egypt quashed the Court of Appeal's judgment. It held that the overestimation of damages was not a valid ground in an action for annulment. 
Now, my next point was, and my final point is, if an award is annulled on the basis of local non-arbitrability and public policy grounds, this is arguably not a basis for refusing recognition and enforcement of the award elsewhere, because it's the non-arbitrability and public policy rules of the recognition state that apply. You'll see on this slide the consequences of setting aside an enforcement um, in the country of origin and abroad. So this brings me back to Article 5.1e of the New York Convention. Um, because this article doesn't actually require the non-recognition of an annulled award, it seems to be open to an enforcement court to enforce an annulled award, particularly if it was annulled based on the non-arbitrability of public policy grounds of the annulment forum. So because the grounds for annulment and non-recognition are now substantively identical in so many jurisdictions, a decision refusing recognition and enforcement could potentially have preclusive effect in other jurisdictions and that it could raise an issue estoppel. So this narrows the distinction between setting aside and recognition proceedings in many ways. But as the question of issue estoppel and preclusion is one of national law, this will need to be considered carefully in this case and in every case. Um, so I'll end there. Um, thank you very much for, for listening and you know, I'm looking forward to the discussion later. With that, I'll pass it on um, to, to the next panelist. Thank you, uh, Rina C. Thank you for the very uh, interesting uh, discussion on the subject. May I now move to the next segment of this uh, webinar that is in relation to enforcement and recognition of foreign arbitrary award. And may I invite Julian to speak first and later followed by LOD. Julian, you have the floor. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Rahmat. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Wait for my, my slides to be called up um, by the admin. You, you'll see the slide behind me is, is reversed for some reason. I don't know why, but hopefully what I say will not be the reverse of what my co-panelists are saying will be consistent with what they, they have been saying. Um, so here, here are my slides. Perhaps we can go to um, the next slide. Uh, just to give a little overview. So what am I going to talk about in my brief allotted time? I'm going to look at things from an English law um, perspective. So, so we'll, we'll, have a, we'll start with a background to the English arbitration landscape. Then we'll look at how the New York Convention has been brought into English law. Uh, in the third segment, we'll look at the effect of enforcement and recognition under English law. And we'll look at um, so, some uh, case law that, that's um, emerged uh, last year. And then we'll look at the grounds for challenge uh, of uh, uh, the enforcement of an arbitral award in England. And again, we'll look at a, a recent case on that. And, and finally, we'll look at what is happening now and what ha might happen in the future for English um, arbitration law, because there's a review that's underway. So let's get to the first uh, part. Next slide, please. So, so when we're looking at the, the English landscape, you can see the, the actual landscape or part of the landscape there on the right. But um, on, on the left, we've got the arbitration landscape, which is set out in the Arbitration Act of 1996. Uh, next slide, please. So, so how does this act work? Where does it apply? Um, I can start perhaps by, by looking at the United Kingdom itself, because I think for, for some people, the United Kingdom may be thought of as, as a single jurisdiction, uh, where, whereas like Malaysia, the, the UK is in fact multi-jurisdictional. So there are different laws that apply across the UK. Now this, this statute, the Arbitration Act 1996, applies in, in all jurisdictions. So, so England, uh, which you see there in yellow, Wales in pink, and Northern Ireland in a sort of greeny colour. Uh, that's where the Act applies. Um, it doesn't apply, however, in Scotland. Scotland has its own uh, laws and um, its own arbitration statute, which, which broadly speaking are consistent with the Arbitration Act 1996, but there are some differences. So th this, this statute applies in most of the UK, and I'm going to be looking at things from an English law perspective, which from a common law point of view it, it, it is the dominant form of law in, in the country. Next slide, please. So what, what does the 1996 Act do? Well, it's best been summarised, I think, in a, in a recent case by, of Halliburton and Chubb by uh, Lord Hodge, who's the Deputy President of the Supreme Court. And he said, 
the 1996 Act is not a complete code of the law of arbitration, but allows the judges to develop the common law in areas which the Act does not address. So in order to understand English arbitration law, um, just like in order to understand Malaysian arbitration or Singapore arbitration law, you need to look at the statute and you need to look at the common law to get the full um, picture. Next slide, please. But if we look at the statute itself, what, what is it? Well, it, it's a single statute uh, that covers both domestic and international arbitrations. I know in some countries like Singapore, for example, there is one statute for domestic arbitrations and one for international arbitrations. That's not the case in, in, in the UK. There's a single statute that addresses both um, situations. Uh, but for international arbitrations, which is what we're, we're concerned with here, um, there's a further distinction made between UK seated arbitrations and, and international arbitrations where the seat is, is elsewhere. Uh, and, and that's what we're largely concerned with today because we're looking at the, the application of the New York um, Convention and, and the enforcement of awards, foreign awards in, in the UK. Next slide, please. But that, when it comes to foreign awards, the, the, the 1996 statute, uh, perhaps like the, like the German laws that uh, Dr. Klötzl considered, uh, not only refers to the New York Convention, which is the dominant uh, international uh, convention on arbitration, but there's also reference to uh, a very old convention, the Geneva Convention of 1927, which, which um, still applies in certain jurisdictions. But it's the New York Convention, which is, is the main game here. Uh, and that's what we're going to be looking at um, today. So let's go to the next slide, please. And, and so what does this statute say about New York Convention awards? Well, first of all, it defines what they are. And this is in section 100, which you see here. So it says in this part, a New York Convention award means an award made in pursuance of an arbitration agreement in the territory of a state other than the United Kingdom, which is a party to the New York uh, Convention. So that's a fairly standard definition of what a New York Convention award is. So it's talking about an award which is made in a, in a New York Convention country, but not in the UK. So it's a foreign, a foreign award. And so what is the effect of, of, of a, a, a New York Convention award when it comes to recognition and enforcement? Well, we get that in, in fairly clear terms from the next section, 101 which says that a New York Convention award shall be recognized as binding on the persons as between whom it was made and may accordingly be relied upon by those persons by way of defense set off or otherwise any legal proceedings in England and Wales or Northern Ireland. And then we've got, when it comes to enforcement, we can see section 101.2, which says a New York Convention award may by leave of the court um, be enforced um, in, in, in the same way as any order judgment order of the court to the same effect. So, so that's making it quite clear that if you have a New York Convention award, then generally speaking, you should be able to bring it to the United Kingdom and it will be recognized and enforced. And that's all good, of course. Next slide, please. So what does this mean? Uh, if, we, if we now move into enforcement and, and recognition, the, the headline point I, I would like to make uh, in relation to enforcement is that the UK is a pro-enforcement uh, jurisdiction. So, and this was summarized by um, a case that went to the Privy Council in 2014. Uh, I've got a quote there from Lord Clark, where he says, the general approach to enforcement of an award should be pro-enforcement. So that is our, our starting point. This is the, the approach of, of the English courts to the enforcement of awards. Next slide, please. But this isn't a, a, an absolute position, uh, and there are, of course, grounds on which awards may, may not be um, enforced or recognised. I'll give an example of, of a case from last year that went to the top court, the Supreme Court, and this is General Dynamics and Libya. So what was this, this uh, case about? Well, in um, 2016, uh, General Dynamics, which is a, a large US defence and uh, aviation contractor, they obtained an award against the state of Libya for 16 million pounds. It was an ICC arbitration um, and the arbitration had a Geneva seat. So it was a seat outside the UK and therefore it was a New York Convention award. So General Dynamics won 
uh, Libya did not pay up. And then in June 20, uh, 2018, General, General Dynamics brought court proceedings in England to seek to enforce the award uh, because it, it thought that there were assets of the government of Libya in the UK against which enforcement could, could be made. So those so proceedings were started in mid-2018. But there then arose a problem for, for General Dynamics because there was a question of how could the enforcement proceedings be served on the Libyan government. Next slide, please. Because um, the, the state of Libya, of course, is a um, sovereign uh, government and, and uh, there is a statute in the United Kingdom and you find it in, in many other countries, which deals with how service of proceedings is effected on, on, on a sovereign uh, government. And the, the relevant statute in the UK is the State Immunity Act. And this is what this case what, what was about, because it deals with service of proceedings on the state. And so section 12.1 uh, of, of this statute says, any writ or other document required to be served for instituting proceedings against a state shall be served by being transmitted through the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. It's now called just the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. Um, so that is how proceedings are served on, on, on a foreign state. So you can't just take the proceedings and stick them in the post box. Uh, that, that's not good enough. It has to go through this particular government um, department. Next slide, please. So that's some further context. Uh, and when it comes to geopolitical issues, most people I'm sure will remember that the situation in 2018 in Libya uh, was not great. There was a civil war going on, um, and you can see from this map that there were various territories that were con controlled by the um, competing factions. Uh, and, and so being conscious of this, General Dynamics were, were, were looking into how they could serve the enforcement proceedings on, on, on the government of, of Libya during the civil war. And the advice they got, apparently, from the Foreign uh, and Commonwealth Office was it would take at least one year to, to serve the proceedings on, on the government of Libya because of the, the turmoil. That was, that was happening in the country at the time. So that, that was rather difficult for them. Uh, next, next slide, please. So what, what did they, they, they do? They, they, they tried to argue that this act did not apply to the enforcement um, proceedings against the government of, of, of Libya. They said it, it, it only applied to, um, uh, it did not apply to New York Convention awards against the state. And, and that the only rules that applied were the, the rules of court, the English rules of court, which, which provide for service in, in, in different ways, um, which, which are much faster, which don't involve the, 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 for, the FCO. So that was the issue that came to the Supreme Court. And, and the UK Supreme Court decided by the narrowest of majorities, 3-2, that this act applied, the State Immunity Act applied here, and therefore the enforcement proceedings could only be um, served through the, the FCO, and that was the only effective way that the, the proceedings could be served on the Libyan government, um, which is, on analysis, a correct application of the statute. Um, but it's certainly a highly technical um, decision, especially when you consider that the Libyan government itself was, was fully represented in, in, the, in these court proceedings. So they knew all about um, what was going on. They weren't uninformed, despite the fact that the they had not received the enforcement proceedings through the, uh, the, the, the medium of the FCO. Um, so I think that, that that's a recent case that highlights a, a unique difficulty that, that can arise when you are seeking to enforce against a state. Now let's go to the, to the next slide, please. That's dealing with enforcement. And now, and now I want to cover um, the, the grounds for, for challenging the enforcement and recognition of a New York Convention award. Um, under the 1996 Act, uh, they're all spelt out there. I, I won't go through them all. Uh, Re Reen has, has covered them um, in, in, in some detail, um, but they're all familiar and, and they, they all mirror what we see, of course, in the New York Convention itself. So, so what we, we can say is that the UK takes an approach which is entirely consistent with, with the, the approach taken in other jurisdictions in, in, in the world when it comes to um, grounds for refusing uh, or, or recognising the enforcement of an arbitral award. Next slide, please. So, so that the, the UK takes this, this, this approach um, 
And, and I just want to, again, focus on a, a fairly recent case where, where these ground, or one of these grounds has been um, successfully uh, invoked. And this is a case, that, again, that went to the Supreme Court, the UK Supreme Court last year. The case is Kebab G and uh, Coot Food Group. What was this case about? Um, it was about some, some rather delicious um, Lebanese food, uh, but it finished up in, in uh, uh, a big uh, arbitration and, and court case. So, so in, in terms of background, um, we have um, Kebab G, which is a Lebanese um, food company. They have a number of restaurants in, in Lebanon and around the Middle East. They, they set up a franchise agreement. They entered into a franchise agreement with a company in Kuwait called Al Hamazi, um, wh whose name you can see there. So the, the franchise or franchisee relationship. Uh, and this franchise agreement was governed by English law and it provided for disputes to be resolved by ICC arbitration with a Paris um, seat. So all, all, all fairly conventional stuff. What happened then? Well, um, Al Hamazi was then acquired, later acquired, by Coot Food Group. And, and, and so it took over Al Hamazi and started running these uh, restaurants in Kuwait. Now, what seems to happen is that Kebab G uh, and, and um, uh, Coot Food Group uh, then had a big falling out. There, there, were, there were issues about um, money and, and, and so forth. And so what Ke Kebab G did was it started an arbitration against Coot Food Group, who, who, who you see the red arrow pointing to. Um, but the, the, the thing you will immediately notice, of course, is that the contract, the franchise agreement, was not between Ke Kebab G and Coot Food Group. It was between Kebab G and El Hamazi. So, so that's, that created a, a certain issue. Next slide, please. But anyway, this, this didn't uh, stop things because um, a, a, a tribunal was constituted, um, seated in France. Uh, the, the respondent, KFG, uh, Coot Food Group, objected to the arbitration um, because they said, well, we're not a party to, to this franchise agreement. There's no arbitration agreement um, between us. However, the ICC tribunal itself uh, took a different view. Um, the, the, the tribunal concluded by, by a 2-1 majority, actually, that um, if you applied French law here, well, KFG was a party to the arbitration agreement um, because of the, the situation that had occurred. They also said that even if you applied English law, there had been a novation of the franchise agreement to Coot Food Group. Therefore, it, it was a party um, to, to the arbitration agreement under the franchise agreement. Uh, and they concluded um, that on, on the merits, that Coot Food Group was liable to pay Kebab G the sum of almost seven million US dollars. So, so this, this created an unexpected problem for, for Coot Food Group. Next slide, please. And it uh, brought set aside proceedings in, in the French courts to, to seek to have the, the award against it set aside. But these proceedings were actually unsuccessful. Um, at the same time, around the same time, Caleb G, the successful party, brought enforcement proceedings in the English courts uh, to try to enforce the award. So, so here you have a what, what, what on its face is a New York Convention award that a party is seeking to enforce in, in England. And, and Coot Food Group sought to resist enforcement in, in, in the UK in reliance on um, one of the grounds matched in section 103.2b, which is that the arbitration agreement was not valid under the law to which the party subjected it. Um, in other words, what KFG was saying was, we are not a party to this arbitration agreement, therefore the award is not binding on us, therefore it should be set aside. Next slide, please. So, so the matter proceeded again all the way to the, to the top uh, court here, here in the United Kingdom, the Supreme Court. And, and this is what the UK Supreme Court um, concluded, and, and this was a unanimous um, decision. Lord, Lord Hamden and Lord Leggett gave the, the judgment of the court. They said the franchise agreement was subject to English law, uh, and therefore English law determines whether Coote Food Group was a party to the arbitration agreement contained within the franchise agreement. So English law applies here. And if you do apply English law, the court said, then 
KFG didn't do anything to make itself a party to the franchise agreement. Uh, you, you remember Al Hamazi was the party to, to the franchise agreement, not Coot Food Group. So, so taking this approach, the Supreme Court said that they would not um, recognize and enforce the, uh, the, the French ICC award. So, so, so in fact, Coot Food Group succeeded uh, in its position before the UK courts. Uh, and from my own perspective, this, this seems to me to be quite a logical decision because it seems though Coot Food Group did not do anything to make itself a party to this, this written arbitration um, agreement. Next slide, please. So, so that, that's, that's a recent example of where an award was, was not recognized, not enforced by, by, by the English, English courts. But let, let me conclude th this little section by just emphasizing the point which I've highlighted in red there, that England is a pro-enforcement and, and pro-arbitration place. So, so New York Convention awards will regularly and routinely um, be, be enforced here. And, and so the two cases I've, I've considered are really anomalies that had unusual features, which is why they progressed all the way to the um, Supreme Court. Next slide, please. Which leads me to my final slide, um, which relates to the future. Now, the, the 1996 Act um, had, had a birthday last year, uh, turned 25. And uh, upon this birthday, the UK's Law Commission decided to undertake a review of, of the Act to, to work out whether there were ways of improving upon it. And, and that, that review is underway. Um, and and, and my, my prediction, I've got a typo, this is predication, it should be prediction. My prediction is that the review will not lead to any, any changes at all, really, in relation to the enforcement of um, New York Convention awards. I think the provisions um, relating to enforcement will remain unchanged. And if anything, what we might see uh, in relation to international arbitrations is uh, some kind of beefing up, perhaps, of the capacity of the UK courts uh, for UK seated arbitrations to provide support to, to, to the arbitral process. So next slide, please. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julian. Thank you for the valuable input as regard to the English jurisdiction. And my invite now, Elodie, uh, the last but not least uh, speaker uh, for this session. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so coming after England, uh, I'll discuss as well recognition and enforcement, but focusing on Singapore uh, and then France, um, which different regime, but basically both uh, very much uh, pro-arbitration and where a refusal to recognize and enforce will be the exception and fairly rare. Um, so starting with Singapore, um, Model Low Country, uh, the relevant act is the Singapore Interna International Arbitration Act, which enacts the New York Convention, uh, which is included in a schedule to the Arbitration Act. Um, so the, the recognition enforcement uh, regime in Singapore is uh, pretty straightforward. It starts um, with uh, an application uh, by the winning party. Uh, to organize them for the award. Uh, it's done uh, with the Singapore High Court and it's ex parte. Um, Singapore courts have uh, reaffirmed routinely that this first step one of applying for the uh, uh, enforcement order ex parte is a mechanical uh, process. Basically, the party needs to have the original or the, or the certified copy of the award of the underlying uh, arbitration agreement. Uh, and that's pretty much it. So here it's, um, and one thing to, start, to think of before starting the arbitration is making sure you do have uh, the original uh, of the uh, contract of the arbitration agreement, uh, because you will need a certified copy or the original at the enforcement stage. So, uh, so it's done, um, so, so I say it's a, it's a mechanistic process is a wording which has been used by Singapore courts to discuss, discuss uh, this first step of applying and obtaining the enforcement order. 
which means uh, the courts, notably in the, the often cited case on this is the Aloe Vera of America case um, of 2006, uh, which is still the, the landmark case on setting out the threshold. Um, and basically the, what the courts have said is that this step doesn't require judicial investigation by the enforcement courts uh, of the award. Uh, it just must make sure the documents require, meaning the arbitration agreement or original certified copy, the award um, have, have been provided. So it's formalistic. There is no investigation of the substance at this stage. Um, so um, once that's done, and there are very limited exceptions, and for sake of time, like uh, there would be very limited exception to this mechanistic process, but basically uh, it will require, um, it, it will be just to correct minor errors or if the parties had consented, um, uh, the, the court can deviate for the award. Um, or in cases, for instance, if a party has changed its, na its names and uh, that may be taken into account at that stage, but that's quite like marginal, uh, basically, very easy to obtain this enforcement order. Um, then uh, the dynamic is going to shift where the, so this was ex parte, the order will then need to be notified to the other side. Uh, and the other side uh, will have the opportunity if it wishes to apply to, um, to challenge the enforcement order. So that's where it become uh, um, the, the grounds to, for refusal um, arise. And the grounds to refuse uh, recognition enforcement, uh, as I say, Singapore is a party to New York Convention, so it will be the New York Convention Article 5 uh, grounds, which are found as well in Section 31 of the Act. Um, so again, no appeal on the merits and very restricted grounds. Uh, and for like um, the last two grounds, uh, it would be the arbitrability, it would be if the, the dispute wasn't arbitrable under Singapore law and for the public policy, what's relevant in the Singapore public policy. Um, and so fairly standard and there is nothing really unusual about the way Singapore courts have uh, approached these grounds, which are, again, we, we've heard um, encountered in other uh, jurisdiction. I may say a word about the public policy grounds because often this is the grounds parties try to use to have like a kind of an appeal on the merits through the back door to criticize uh, the merits of the awards, which otherwise is not possible uh, under the New York Convention grounds. Um, that won't work in Singapore. Singapore courts have been uh, very firm about how narrow the public policy ground is and Singapore public policy. And the, the Court of Appeal in Singapore has like consistently stressed uh, and I can read from the uh, Strandor Invest case in 2010 by the High Court citing this line of case law by the Court of Appeal. Um, the Court of Appeal has stressed that although the concept of public policy is not defined in the Arbitration Act or the Model Law, the general consensus of gen judicial and expert opinion is that public policy under the Act encompasses a narrow scope. In our view, it should only operate in instances where the upholding of an arbitral award will shock the conscience or is clearly injurious to the public good or wholly offensive to the ordinary reasonable and fully informed member of the public or where it violates the forum, Singapore's most basic notion of morality and justice. Um, so again, like extremely restrictive and not a backdoor to an appeal on the merits. Um, so if I may like uh, mention a, a few Singapore cases, um, just to illustrate how Singapore courts have actually implemented these provisions on recognition and enforcement. Um, one fairly recent case is an example of a, a rare example of a refusal to recognize and enforce in the ST Group uh, versus Sanam Investment Limited by the Court of Appeal. So here the issue where the arbitration had been commenced under two agreements, a master agreement and a participation agreement, where the master agreement provided for Macau seat of arbitration, 
the participation agreement for Singapore and SIC arbitration. And the claimant opted to command the arbitration on the basis uh, of the arbitration agreement in the participation agreement. So they come to Singapore seated arbitration administered by the SIC. Again, the objection of the respondent. Um, and so the claimant prevailed in this arbitration. It obtained the leave to enforce the award in Singapore. Then the respondent sought to set aside the order granting the leave to enforce. And it prevailed. Uh, what the, the court found is that actually the, the arbitration was commenced and there was concerned with the master agreement and had nothing to do with the participation agreement. The master agreement at the close uh, provided for Macau as a seat. Um, so there was the, the court found that this triggered um, section 31.2e of the uh, International Arbitration Act, which is um, that the composition of the arbitral authority of the arbitral procedure was not in accordance with the agreement of the parties. Because the court found basically there was a mistake both on the seat, it should have been Macau, not Singapore, and on the, as well on the, on the number of arbitrators. Because the SIC rules provided um, appointed three member tribunal, the, the SIC appointed a three member tribunal. Uh, the court found the default position where the parties had agreed on a number of uh, arbitrator in a Macau seated arbitration would have been a sole arbitrator, not a three member tribunal. So, based on these, three, two, these two mistakes, the, seat, the composition of the tribunal, the court refused, um, upheld the application to set aside the enforcement order. And the court added, there was no need for the respondent to prove these two mistakes had led to a prejudice. They, they, they alone were sufficient to refuse enforcement. Um, and uh, one interesting point as well in that case is that there was the issue uh, the, the, the respondent, the Lao party, hadn't participated in the arbitration. So one issue the claimant um, raised in this uh, proceeding to challenge the enforcement was uh, they argued that the respondents had waived their right to object to these issues of the seat and the composition of the tribunal or were stopped from raising them because they raised them for the first time in the appeal proceedings uh, before Singapore courts in the end, uh, regarding the enforcement. The court rejected that objection of waiver of estopel. It found that when uh, it characterized the resisting enforcement as a passive action. Uh, so the court found when in such passive remedy, resisting enforcement, uh, the respondent could not be prevented from raising their objections to the seat and the composition of the tribunal in support of their contention that the award should not be enforced in Singapore. So we, irrespective of the fact that these parties hadn't uh, participated, raised these objections in the arbitration, hadn't participated in the arbitration, and raised these points for the first time uh, in the enforcement proceedings. Um, and, um, so just looking at time, maybe I'll mention another case, which is also um, um, quite interesting um, because there is a question of what happens to recognition and enforcement in Singapore if there are set aside proceedings pending at the seat or if the award actually has been set aside at the seat. On the first point, the if set aside proceedings are pending at the seat, um, there is a case, a uh, fairly recent case, 2018, uh, Man Diesel Turbo, before the Singapore High Court, which raised that issue where the seat of arbitration was in Denmark. Um, the losing party applied to set aside the award in Denmark, and in parallel, the winning party uh, obtained leave to enforce the award in Singapore. Then the losing party applied to Singapore courts to challenge this. Um, to set aside this enforcement order on in the alternative to ask that the enforcement proceeding be stayed pending the set aside application in Denmark. Uh, the court enjoys discretion 
in granting or not the stay or refusing enforcement um, due to these pending uh, proceedings. In that case, the court refused to uh, basically upheld the enforcement order, refused to stay the enforcement proceedings. Uh, it found and it looked in particular at the, um, it expressed the view that the set aside application lacked merits. So it looked at the, the arguments made in the set aside application. It found basically that either change of success and on balance in the interest of the parties, um, it's it, uh, considered there was more of a risk of staying or not granting enforcement to the claimant than to um, proceeding and granting enforcement because uh, there was the, the, the respondent faced little or no risk of prejudice as uh, it set aside application and little chance of success. On the other, um, so what if the award has actually been set aside at the seat? Uh, I'm not aware of any Singapore case which has actually decided that issue, the enforcement of a set award at the seat. Um, so again, that's Article 5, um, 5.1e of the New York Convention. The Singapore courts would have, they may, they would have discretion to set aside, to, to uh, refuse enforcement of a set aside award. Um, the, so the only case in Singapore which has come touched upon the issue, but it was obiter, is in a case PT First Media in 2014, um, in which the, the court expressed uh, serious doubt as to whether it would retain a discretion to enforce an award that has been set aside at the seat of arbitration. Um, so, so this is a, a, as close as Singapore courts uh, came to the issue. Um, I think, I mean, uh, considering the attitude of Singapore courts, the fact they are party to New York Convention and this obiter, I think we are yet to guess what would happen. It would probably be what has been seen for in the US where it wouldn't be an approach as liberal as France, and I will come to it later, where the courts would just enforce an award set aside at the seat. Uh, still, they have discretion to do so based on the language may in Article 5.1e of the New York Convention. So, but it would probably take a high threshold, like in the US, for instance, like a breach of natural justice in the foreign proceedings. Uh, so it would be probably quite a, an uphill battle to enforce an award set aside abroad in Singapore. But that's just like a, my guess, because it hasn't been, a, a, we don't have a decision on that yet. Um, I'll just say like uh, mindful of the time and um, I just say a few words on France and um, you see it may be relevant to a discussion we're going to have uh, just after. Um, so France very much, very liberal, very pro arbitration. Uh, it is party to New York Convention. However, New York Convention is not that relevant in practice in uh, recognition and enforcement proceedings in France. Um, there, is a, there are a number of articles in the Code of Civil Procedure addressing recognition and enforcement, and which are basically more favorable. They have less grounds than the New York Convention. So based on Article 7 of the New York Convention, which preserved the application of national law, which would be more favorable to recognition and enforcement, French courts uh, usually would apply the provisions of the Code of Civil Procedure um, rather than the New York Convention itself. On most grounds, it doesn't make a difference really, but it makes a difference on the enforcement of set aside, uh, awards set aside at the seat. Um, so again, I mean, the procedure, similar to Singapore, it would start with an ex parte enforcement uh, order, uh, and then the other party uh, is notified of it and can uh, challenge that order and seek to have recognition and enforcement denied. So here it wouldn't be usually under Article 5 of the New York Convention. It would be uh, Articles 5, uh, 15, 20 um, of the Code of Civil Procedure, which has a list of grounds which is similar to the New York Convention, except it doesn't contain uh, the fact that an award, the ground like 51E, that the award has been set aside at the seat. And the position consistently taken by French courts 
uh, based uh, using Article 7 of the New York Convention, so applying French law to this question, is that um, an arbitrary set aside at the seat may be recognized uh, in France uh, because uh, it is not uh, set aside is not a, a, a ground listed in the Code of Civil Procedure, and the French court have taken also very much um, a very liberal approach, and I found. Um, the leading decision uh, is a court of cassation decision in 2007, Putra Bali, but which has been followed since, uh, in which the court, in a recon an allowing recognition and enforcement of a set aside award, have found that an, an, an international arbitral award, which is not anchored in any national legal order, is a decision of international justice whose validity must be ascertained with regard to the rules applicable to the country, here France, where its recognition and enforcement are, are sought. Um, so again, like, uh, and that's been uh, re, like consistently followed for uh, afterwards and including court of appeal decisions in July, 2021, in January, 2022. So it's a well-established position in France uh, and a very liberal one um, that uh, it's probably, I would say, like the quite unique, uh, but it's a, a jurisdiction where it is possible. Um, and actually, it is expected that you will be able to enforce an award set aside at the seat. You won't, you won't need a high threshold of regional natural justice or really like. Um, uh, something which more often than not, you will not be able to achieve. Just, uh, it's not a ground, it's not a ground, the award can be enforced. Um, and uh, I think uh, I'll stop there uh, and uh, so that we can uh, move to a discussion of a very international award. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Elodie. Thank you for the I like for highlighting the French uh, jurisdiction on uh, arbitration. And uh, I think uh, you would agree with me that all the evidence speakers have covered all the uh, critical issues on endowment recognition and enforcement of arbitration. So our third and final segment is in relation to uh, the current uh, arbitral or recent arbitral award of Sumu claims of Busawa. And uh, later on, perhaps I've, I've gathered uh, questions also from the participants, maybe after this last segment, we will highlight or post those questions to all the panelists. So in, in regard to uh, this last segment, perhaps uh, one would like to highlight on the implications of the, um, you know, one of the parties uh, refusal to participate in the arbitration um, what about your view on uh, the appointment of uh, sole arbitrators, the mechanics and role of the state courts in forming an ad hoc uh, arbitral tribunal? Uh, and uh, should, for example, jurisdictional objection be raised before the tribunal? So these are some of the questions. Perhaps you know you may not want to uh, uh, strictly. Uh, raise this issue, perhaps your comment on, uh, your general comment uh, on, on the uh, tribunal, uh, the arbitral award by uh, the single arbitrator. I will open the, the floor to any one of you who would like to start first uh, this uh, discussion. Uh, uh, Professor Ramat Mohammed, yes, if I, I may start. Uh, I have, of course, uh, the difficulty that we do not know anything, uh, not, not all about uh, the Sulu Award, but we have seen it, and I think an important part is missing, which is the preliminary award on jurisdiction that has been made, which is, which is of course, uh, uh, some point which is mentioned in the final award. Uh, I have uh, basically three points where I see uh, 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 issues. Uh, First is the agreement to arbitrate. Uh, the, the interesting thing is that there is a discrepancy in the language uh, in the award itself. 
where, where it is said, shall be submitted to the Britannic Majesty Council General for Borneo. That is, that's how it's mentioned in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the anti-suit, uh, uh, anti-arbitration injunction of the Malaysian court. Uh, whereas in the final award, it says, for consideration of their Majesty's Council General in Brunei. Uh, so, so of course, I don't know anything about the, the region itself, but uh, uh, how it is quoted in the final award, it looks to me rather uh, a, a, an issue of the seat when it says in Brunei, which would mean that, that there has been an agreement of the then parties uh, to have a, an arbitration conducted in Brunei and not in, uh, in uh, that, that, that there was no agreement uh, on the face of arbitration. So, so, so this is something, of course, which I cannot settle at all, but there I think is a problem. And the general principle, uh, what, what I would, uh, of course, look at is the question whether there were courts existing at that time uh, uh, or whether the council uh, uh, general was a, a natural person who was outside the court system. And if that would be the case, I think one could come to an agreement that this is that the jurisdiction of the regular court has been ousted. The second point which really struck me is the shift of the seat of the arbitration from Madrid uh, 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 to, to Paris at some point of the proceedings where I uh, uh, see a really a, a, a measure which I can understand to some extent, but on the other hand, that is a striking point where I, uh, of course, see a problem once the arbitral tribunal is appointed and once a seat has been determined, I think that is fixed. Uh, 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 and uh, and uh, so, so I'm, I'm not sure whether an arbitral tribunal or a civil arbitrator could deviate from an internal decision he has made on that point. And the third and final point is uh, the, 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 the applicable law. I think uh, uh, the, the final award applies the Unigua principles, which is a kind of lex mercatoria. And of course, this is no particular national law. Uh, many, many years ago on, on an IBA conference, uh, one of uh, the colleagues uh, uh, when asked what is lex mercatoria, uh, mercatoria he said, this is like a rainbow. You see it clearly in the sky, but if you try to grab it, uh, you have a problem. And uh, I think, uh, you know, the problem with applying these general principles is that you must be distinguish whether this is ex equo et bono, uh, because uh, a, a decision ex equo et bono is only permissible with uh, the consent of two parties. So that that are my three areas where where I feel uh, 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 that that one should really consider uh, and waste some brain uh, uh, to look at these points uh, in, in, in going forward. But of course, as I said earlier, uh, it's very complex. Uh, the whole case, if you look through it, the procedural history, which is given in, in all detail, and uh, and uh, and uh, let us see how matters are going forward. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Yeah. And I have other views from the panelists. Maybe I'll make a, just a couple of points to, to follow it. Again, I'm not commenting, I guess, I mean, specifically on the grounds like that can be brought or not, and because we don't have the full picture, it's not really our role to do that. Um, I mean, on the question of like non-participating, not participating party, I think uh, as in France, it's, it would be the same in Singapore. Uh, as long as the party um, has been, the respondent has been notified, has been given an opportunity to participate in the proceedings, the fact that he chose not to uh, will have no bearing uh, on the enforcement or on the, um, the, 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 it won't be a ground to set aside the award. Uh, so it just, uh, um, and that's pretty, I mean, that's pretty clear. So the question would be actually where, um, was there issues with notice or not, which, um, I mean, I would be surprised <laughs> if there was, but uh, maybe. They, so um, default in itself, not a ground uh, to set aside. Um, then um, 
I mean, there is a question because uh, partial award on jurisdiction, presumably the time limit to set that aside would have expired. So were there any proceedings or what's happening with that? Uh, because if the time limit has expired, um, um, that, that part is probably uh, uh, not up for discussion anymore. Uh, and just one, one last uh, thought. Um, was a mention of an anti-arbitration injunction from the court in Malaysia. Um, I think, again, it's not a ground to refuse, uh, in itself to refuse uh, um, enforcement in France or to set aside in France. Uh, so that in it itself shouldn't have a bearing um, on the award being upheld in France, unless, and I don't know what the situation is, unless there was a, a Malaysian court order uh, or judgment related to the case which is enforced in France, which has been enforced, given exequatur in France, which I'm not aware there is. In that situation, there could be a question as to whether basically to have a conflicting award and judgment or order um, exe uh, with exequatur in France, could that give rise to a breach of uh, French public policy? Uh, but from what I know on the facts, we're not in that situation uh, where the Malaysian court order would have been, uh, would have received exequatur in France. So if it doesn't, it shouldn't have a bearing on the set aside proceedings. These were just a few thoughts. Thank you, lady. Thank you. Any more? Uh, yes, I, I can see Julian would like to say something. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Just a couple of points, which I think are consistent with what is being uh, said. Um, first relates to non-participation and, and something that can be observed about not participating is that it, it comes with a risk if you don't turn up and, and make your points before the tribunal. Well, there's a, a real risk that, that if you have good points that they won't be taken into account. Now, there are ways of, of dealing with this uh, and getting the best of both worlds and, and one way uh, maybe to make a jurisdictional objection from the outset and to make it absolutely clear that the party, the respondent, objects to the proceedings, objects to the, the, the jurisdiction of the tribunal, whatever it is. But then it, it makes submissions in the arbitration without prejudice to, to, to that um, jurisdictional objection. That, that's one way of, of dealing with things, which can be um, quite effective, I think. Uh, and, and the second... Um, point uh, I wanted to make comes back to the number of arbitrators. Now, in, in this um, Suli case, which seems very unusual, not, not a, a normal sort of commercial arbitration by any means, um, from what I understand, the reason a sole arbitrator was appointed was because this is what the rules of the, the, the Spanish court say, that for, for, for such a case where the court is appointing an arbitrator, then there should be a sole arbitrator. Um, and, and, and so the, the observation I would make is certainly uh, court rules where, where they apply and, and statutes need to have built into them a, a certain amount of flexibility, because clearly if a case is for, uh, as it was here, for several billion dollars, um, sending it to a, a sole arbitrator is uh, potentially risky for, for, for a number of, of, of reasons. Um, and, and I think coming back to the... Uh, uh, the old three heads versus one head debate, which we have at every arbitration conference, it seems, um, for, for, for such a, a large and significant claim, not only in monetary terms, but certainly for, for Malaysia as a country, uh, then this is clearly the sort of case that requires um, three arbitrators as a minimum, I would have thought. Thank you, Julian. Ah, yes, uh, Rita, please. And um, I don't think I have too much to add to, to what has been said before, with which I, you know, I, I agree. Um, I think what is interesting about the Fornan case is the number of issues it raises, and not just about um, annulment or, or setting aside, but um, at really all stages um, relating to anti-arbitration injunctions, um, the role of the seat, um, and so on. And so I think, uh, you know, I, I agree with what Dr. Quetzal um, said earlier about the three main issues. Um, and, and in addition, the uh, non-participation of the respondent and perhaps echoing what Elodie and Julian have said earlier as well, I mean, it's well established that, um, uh, and it's an article 25 actually of the model law, 
uh, that um, unless otherwise agreed by the parties, an arbitral tribunal may continue the proceedings and 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 um, make an award on the evidence before it. Um, it's not a default award, but uh, it's one where the tribunal would have to go into the evidence as well. And so that's a little bit different from um, in litigation proceedings. But having said that, uh, because that there are these um, opportunities, um, as Julian has mentioned, to uh, participate or make his jurisdictional objection known at the arbitration stage, um, and then at the court stage uh, after preliminary ruling on jurisdiction, um, in some ways, if the respondent doesn't participate, it, it, it's, it sort of squanders its opportunity to, to make those points at the arbitration phase, uh, at the court phase at that, at that stage. But of course, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, uh, uh, to annul an award or to, to, to um, uh, set aside um, or not to recognize or, or enforce uh, an award for lack of jurisdiction, that is something that the courts do take seriously. Um, and we consider it on a de novo basis. Um, so I think th that um, is one sort of interesting aspect of the award, as well as the importance of the seat. I think Dr. Furtzel mentioned territoriality at the very start of his presentation, and this shows the importance um, of the, the role of the seat uh, in an arbitration. Um, so I think it will be very interesting to see uh, what the French courts ultimately do in this case. Thank you very much, Rina. I think that's about all that uh, we, we have on the three segments. But before we end this session, I think there are questions uh, from participants that I think I would like to read one by one. Uh, uh, it's all in the, in the chat box. Um, I think some of it, uh, I think Julian, you have your track to answer the question or should I read it again? Well, I, I've, I've answered uh, Okay. What questions I think have been directed towards me. Okay, so can we pass the question or should we read again? Maybe, I don't know, do, do you want to go to one that hasn't been answered? Uh, okay, then we move on to the other questions. Um, there is one question. Uh, it's, I think it's open to any participant, uh, sorry, uh, uh, panelists. Uh, this question is, uh, I'm wondering whether there is a case that annul arbitration award. This is the question. Yeah? I'm wondering whether there is a case that annul arbitration award. Can you please explain in what event or reasons that an arbitration award can be annulled? Anyone, uh, anyone panelists would like to answer this? Um, happy to take a shot. I think the um, the I, I've discussed the grounds on which, um, at least in the model law, uh, it provides for the setting aside or annulment um, of awards, which I use interchangeably, um, set aside and annulment. Um, it, these grounds are basically identical to um, to those in the New York Convention for um, you know re refusing the recognition and enforcement of an award. So there are there are cases in which um, arbitration awards have been annulled. Um, I think um, I think some have been mentioned in in in, um, in the various presentations. Um, but often, uh, you know, these are grounds that, particularly where there is a lack of an arbitration agreement, um, where awards have been annulled, uh, particularly in cases of, of non-signatories to an arbitration award. Um, as Julian has discussed in the Kabaji case. Thank you. I will move on to the next question. This is rather long. Um, if an award is announced or set aside on the grounds of excess of jurisdiction. Uh, hold on, I missed that. If an, uh, I repeat, yeah. if an award is annulled or set aside on the ground of excess of jurisdiction, is the claimant entitled to rec recommend a fresh arbitration against the respondent to reassert the same claim? That is the first question. Yeah. Can uh, the claimant entitled to recommend for a fresh arbitration against the respondent to reassert the same claim? And the second question, if the answer to number one is yes, 
what happens if the claimant's cause of action is now time barred? Yeah. If the answer is yes, what happens if the claimant's cause of action is now time barred? And third, some local statute provide that the court is annulling or setting aside the award may order that the time between the commencement of the first arbitration and the order annulling slash setting aside the award may be excluded from the calculation of the limitation period. So the question is, when should this power be invoked? And are there any decided cases in your respective jurisdiction? I hope it's clear. The Yeah, Professor, if I may just give an answer from the yes. perspective of German Please. law. Uh, I think uh, a limitation of action is, of course, a, a question as to the merits of the law, as opposed to common law countries, at least from the German perspective. And if you commence arbitration proceedings uh, during that process, the time uh, of the limitation period is suspended. Uh, so it's an interesting question if uh, an award uh, uh, is, is rendered and is then set aside at a later stage. Uh, the, 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 my initial reaction would be that once the decision to set aside is from a perspective, it, it, it served on, 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 on the other side, the, the, just a reasonable time period would have to be observed to recommence an action for, for the same cause of action, if that is possible. Uh, uh, um, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, you would not have the full three years or six years or whatever the statutory, statutory limitation period would be. Uh, uh, you would have only a reasonable period uh, if the limitation period, the statutory is already over, to start after the, uh, uh, after the annulment decision. So, so uh, that that would be that would be a perspective from the German law because it's clear as long as the arbitration is going on, uh, the the the, the uh, limitation periods are not running any longer. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. Uh, Julian would like to respond. Yeah, thank you. Well, Professor, uh, from an English law um, perspective, the, the position is actually rather different from that described by uh, Dr. Klotzel. Uh, in that if you have, uh, certainly uh, under English law arbitrations, if you have an arbitration that is brought uh, and there's an award and the award is, is set aside, uh, yes, a fresh arbitration may be commenced in relation to the, the, the subject matter, the dispute, um, because the, the law treats it as though there was no arbitration, it had no, no, no legal status. But from a limitation, uh, a time limitation point of view, time only starts running once the second arbitration is brought. So, so the fact that a, a, an earlier arbitration was commenced and was later, um, the, the award was set aside, that's, that's treated as of no effect for the purposes of stopping time. So if, if the second arbitration is, is brought and it's brought out of time, that's too bad. The, 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 the respondent then has a limitation, a time limitation defense. Thank you, Yulin. Okay. Yeah. If I may just add, I mean, in, on the question one scenario, in, in most countries, the award was, wouldn't be entirely annulled, only the part which was in excess of jurisdiction would be. Uh, so I'm not sure when claim would be brought in a second arbitration, because assuming the claims which were within the terminal jurisdiction were de decided in the first arbitration, um, if the award is set aside because uh, the court considers the arbitrator went beyond, um, then it will be, I mean, thinking the court got it wrong and trying to re restart a, an arbitration before a second tribunal. Um, again, uh, you would have to be quite optimistic, <laughs> but usually, I mean, the, the main, the, the part of the award within the tribunal jurisdiction wouldn't be annulled. It would be a partial annulment. Um, on the time bar, I mean, time bar issues are really uh, complicated and uh, jurisdiction specific. Uh, I would say my, like from my experience of time bar, time bar, I would also think if claims were brought in the first arbitration, if even if there was a letter set aside, uh, this claim, the, the time, the time, the 
time limit should have been interrupted. Um, but again, I mean, that's really pretty much a jurisdiction specific issue um, uh, on time bar. Thank you, Elodie. Jay, do we have um, more time on questions? Um, I think we can have one more. Okay. All right. Uh, there is one question. Uh, I think this has been answered by Dr. Thomas. Uh, I, there is one question. Uh, wait, hold on. Uh, this is the first question, I think. It is understood from the New York Convention that the award will not be enforceable at the state of enforcement when the award has been set aside by the seat of arbitration. Would there be any exception? Continue. I vaguely recall that there is a recent decision in the French court that the award is enforceable even though the award was set aside at the seat of arbitration. I think this is a question posed to, I think Julian has answered this, yeah? Uh, I, I was wondering, Professor, whether this might be a question more for Elodie because it's referring to a French court decision. Oh, okay, right. Maybe yeah. you would like to respond to the question. Yes, so I mean, there have been a, the French law is um, uh, quite consistent on this, and there have been court decisions, including court of cassations for the past like probably 20 years, uh, including recent ones. Uh, I think uh, a key one is a court of cassation case in Putra Bali in 2007, which I mentioned, which basically it would be in France, an award set aside at the seat um, will be enforced because the set aside at the seat is not a ground to refuse recognition and enforcement uh, under the French code of civil procedure, which is more favorable than the New York Convention. Uh, so yes, uh, in France, an award will be set aside will be enforced. Other jurisdictions, it's more difficult because um, you cannot usually, especially model law jurisdiction, you cannot rely on Article 7 of the New York Convention saying, the national law is more favorable than the New York Convention because the grounds match the New York Convention ones and include the, an award being set aside at the seat. So then you would have only a narrow window to enforce a set aside award, which would be to get a court to exercise its discretion under Article 5 of the New, of the New York Convention, because it may, it doesn't have to refuse recognition and enforcement, but from the few cases available like worldwide on this, it would really take a high threshold like breach of natural justice um, in the set aside proceedings in the uh, foreign country. So it would be much more difficult than in France. Right, thank you, Elodie. I think that will be the last question in this webinar. So um, before I pass uh, this to Jay, I would like on behalf of uh, the Institute to thank all the eminent speakers for their wonderful and very articulate presentation on the subject of annulment, recognition and enforcement. And I think uh, this uh, webinar has been very fruitful and uh, we appreciate your, and we appreciate your valuable comment and input particularly in relation to the recent uh, development or the recent arbitral award in the Sulu claims. So thank you. Thank you very much on behalf of uh, the Institute. May I now pass the uh, to, to Jay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I guess that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you very much, Professor Rahmat, Thomas, Elodie, Julian, and Rina for their presentations and the insightful panel discussion. But before we formally end, we wish to remind everyone of the following announcements. AIADR will hold the first installation of its online fellowship roundtable series on May 13, 2022, from 6 p.m., 7.15 p.m. Malaysia time. There, we will tackle another interesting topic, and the topic will be the impact of international mediation principles on apology legislation. For more information, please take a photo of the QR code that you see on your screen, right? I'm giving you five seconds. Take a photo of that QR code so you can join us. All right.
The next announcement is that AIADR is calling for contributions to the AIADR Journal of International ADR Forum and the ADR Centurion. Uh, can you show me the next slide? There you go. All right, please submit your articles to AIADR.editor at AIADR.world. All right, that's AIADR.editor at AIADR. Dot world. It's, it's a perfect opportunity to showcase your articles to the rest of the world, right? The next announcement is, of course, um, if you have not yet done so, please consider joining AIADR, right? For, for, for more information, please, please do not hesitate to visit the website of AIADR. That's www.aiadr.world. All right, that concludes our today's webinar. Again, I am your MC, J. Patrick Santiago. And on behalf of the AIADR, thank you very much for joining us at today's event. It has been a wonderful and insightful afternoon slash evening indeed. We hope to see you at the next AIADR event. Goodbye. <laughs>